Welcome to Fireside Chat number three. Uh, today I interpret interpretivism for you. Remember, interpretivism is an epistemology that is in direct conflict with positivism. In fact, it can be said to represent in almost every respect uh, the opposite of positivism. We can start with the understanding that interpreters have that the social world is very different from the physical or the biological world. In my last chat I made clear the principal reasons for this had to do with the reflexivity of human beings uh, from which it followed that any kind of proposition, let alone a law, would only function so long as the social understandings and relations that allowed it to continue to exist. But people reflect on their behavior. People's behavior changes as a result of that reflection. Over time, practices change and any laws would be undermined. There's a further uh, tweak to this, which Max Weber uh, was among the first to notice, and that is to the extent to which we have laws and they're understood, people plan around them, and in doing so, undermine the laws. Uh, a famous example of this is the January effect in the American stock markets. Uh, for many decades in the post-war period, it was uh, clear that there was a bump in the stock market in January. And investors took this into account. The reason for it, it turned out, was that end-of-year reports came out. And in good years, and for most of the post-war era, they were good years, the uh, market went up. Once individual and institutional investors understood this and discounted it, the effect no longer occurred. For interpretivists, uh, therefore, uh, the social world is very different and we have to start with the understandings that people themselves have of it the understandings they have of themselves as well, the kinds of goals they pursue, their perceptions of the constraints and opportunities uh, operating on them, and how they feel constrained or enabled by the relationships they have with people and institutions, or indeed their hostility uh, toward them. An example that, alas, comes readily to mind is the uh, President Trump. Uh, so many of his policies can be understood as attempts to undo what his predecessor, Obama, did. Uh, there is a very evident hostility here that drives how the President behaves and leads him to do many irrational things. Uh, including doing away with all the efforts that Obama had made with the uh, Center for Disease Control to make preparations for a future epidemic. Now, interpretivists make some substantive assumptions about the world, assumptions that differ from the positivists. For the positivists, you recall, the world is out there waiting to be discovered. The concepts that we use to discover it are our own creations, but ultimately we're driven to concepts that fit more closely with the world because they produce better theories, and we know they're better theories because we evaluate them empirically. Interpretivists argue that in the social world, the concepts that we have not only describe that world, 
but they create it. The social world is a product of the human mind. As human goals, conceptions, priorities, behavior change, so does the social world. And what made sense at one moment in history or in time uh, may make no sense at a later date to people. And therefore, theories or explanations based on it will lose whatever traction uh, they had. Uh, it follows, therefore, that rather than knowledge being universal and applicable everywhere as it is in the physical and biological sciences, that knowledge has to be historically and culturally local. We have to understand the geist, the mindset, the structure of a culture to understand why and how people behave as they do. Uh, Clifford Geertz, the famous anthropologist, used the term soak and poke <laughs> to describe the nature of anthropological research. Uh, this is a classic example of interpretivism. People put themselves uh, inside the cultures, subcultures, groups, elites uh, that they're trying to study to see the world through their eyes and develop a kind of understanding which isn't necessarily theoretical but that allows them to make generalizations uh, about what they observe. And those generalizations may be used for purposes of explanation but interpretivists are very wary about using them for making predictions. This I will come back to. What is important here is if we soak and poke, we're trying to understand uh, the ways in which people relate. Fundamental to this, or what makes it possible, is language. And I mean by language not only the words and sentences that we use uh, to think and express our thoughts and feelings to one another, uh, but rather as well uh, the practices and concepts that they embody. So if we play a sport, these words that we use to describe it's uh, your serve in tennis is a shorthand to a set of rules that govern the interactions. You couldn't play a game of tennis with somebody who didn't share those interactions. Uh, he might or she might be able to hit a ball, but it would mean something very different. I'll give you an example from international relations, which after all these, these talks are about. In the 19th century, the European powers and the United States carved out coastal enclaves in China which they use for purposes of trading and uh, uh, wanted very much to exercise full control over these territories. One of the issues that arose was how to treat criminals, in particular Westerners who broke the rules, broke the laws, committed violence against other people. The Western powers demanded what they called extraterritoriality, a concept rooted in sovereignty, the assumption in sovereignty that every political unit has an absolute right to govern on its own territory. The Westerners instead insisted that China give them the right to try criminals, even though in theory it was Chinese territory. The Chinese readily agree. Why? Chinese reasoned. If the barbarians want to punish their own, this is fine with us. We don't have to sully our hands with it. In Western eyes, the Chinese response 
look like a sign of weakness because no leadership should give up control over a territory. It led them to make further demands against China. So what subjectivists, excuse me, what interpretivists call intersubjective understandings are absolutely central to social and political life from micro-level social interactions to macro-level international relations. We have to reconstruct them from the inside and use them as our framework for understanding. We can't come in with some notion like the balance of power and assume that it applies to a context in which it is not developed. Um, and in fact, and we'll come to this in another chat, in Asia, uh, for much of its history, there was no balance of power. Relations among political units were organized very differently. Interpretivists uh, further argue that there is another fundamental distinction between the physical and the social world that has to do with the reality or lack of reality of the core units and concepts that sciences in both would use. So some of you may have seen in the previous talk by thermometer uh, sitting here and wondering what it was doing. Well, it's the prop, and it's very nice to have a prop in one of these talks that I'm going to use right now. What is temperature? What is this mercury that's in the 60s here? What, what is it telling us and why is it useful? Well, those of you who have had any kind of uh, background, even in secondary school in physics, will know that temperature is a measure of the energy level of molecules. The more energetic they become, the more they expand, not they, but whatever they're composing. So if you have mercury and it becomes more energetic, the mercury will expand and in the thermometer it's forced up a tube and it gives you a reading of thermometer. And of temperature and mercury is used because it's perfect for room temperature. It readily expands and contracts from, let's say, uh, an average room temperature. What's important here is that we have multiple scales for measuring temperature. This one, since I'm in the United States at the moment in the glorious state of New Hampshire, is in Fahrenheit. It could be in centigrade, and of course we also have Kelvin, which starts with absolute zero. These scales are different, but by very simple formulae, each scale of temperature is readily translatable into the others. And any time you do this, you'll get a result that other people will agree is right. The only difference may be measurement error. So, no matter who measures temperature, assuming their scales are more or less accurate, you'll get the same reading. Therefore, when we talk of something like temperature, we're ultimately talking about a physical process that takes place in the world that can be described as real. Uh, this is not the case when we come to the social and especially the political world. Think of markets, the balance of power, polarity, state structure, uh, even war. Uh, all of these things are reifications. That is, they're products of the human mind which we treat as if they were real. Uh, take polarity. Ken Waltz 
is very famous as a theorist in international relations for arguing that bipolar systems are more peace prone and enduring than multipolar systems. A bipolar system is one in which there are two dominant political units very much more powerful than any others. A multipolar system is one in which there are three or more multiple political units that may vary in power but none of them all that much stronger than another. Now, leave aside the claims that Waltz makes, they rest on the assumption that polarity is important and something that can be measured. Uh, yet, what is polarity? Well, it's a measure of the power of states. And what is power? Waltz and Morgenthau both offer 10 different criteria for what constitutes power. Military capability, size of the country, size of its population, wealth, quality of leadership. There's a list ending up with these 10 variables. Uh, to have 10 people measure the power of states, they would all have to agree on the relative importance of these 10 variables and how you measure them. You take military capability. What is it? Is it a product of the number of tanks and airplanes and rifles and bullets and soldiers people have? Or does it reside in strategies and leadership that use effectively uh, what capability they have? And maybe if it is, they're able to use it well in one kind of conflict, but not at all in another. In other words, uh, each of these concepts has multiple components to it. Each of them have multiple components, and each measure of each of these multiple components is highly subjective. It's ideas all the way down. At no point do we get to molecules and their level of energy. Uh, for this reason, at the end of the Cold War, realists, and they're the ones who take polarity and the balance of power seriously, couldn't agree among themselves as to the polarity of the world. Ken Waltz, the father of all of this, insisted that the world was still bipolar because only the United States and Russia, the successor state to the Soviet Union, had nuclear arsenals that were capable of destroying each other, anyone else, if not the entire world. Uh, other realists, including at the time my colleagues at uh, Dartmouth College, uh, Bill Walforth, Steve Brooks, Mike Mastanduno, um, argued that the world was unipolar, that now that the Soviet Union had collapsed, the United States was left as the sole superpower. It was in a position that was hegemonic. As a result, the world was unipolar. But other realists, I think perhaps a majority, argue that the world was now multipolar. Uh, among them, Ken Waltz's acolyte, John Mearsheim. Well, this is the problem with social science. It's very hard to agree because we're not measuring molecules. Interpretivists go a step further. They say any of these measures and any of the interpretations of any of these measures are products in the mind of analysts. To use them to analyze political behavior assumes that political actors think and see the world and evaluate these concepts the same way as the analyst. Uh, there's no reason whatsoever to think this is the case. So for instructivists, excuse me, for interpretivists, 
I was running together constructivism and interpretivism, and that's fair enough because constructivists are all interpretivists. For interpretivists, we have to have what I call bottom-up social science. We start with actors and we try to reconstruct their decisions by seeing the world as they do, by seeing what their goals are, how they make choices if they do among them, and how they perceive their environment and what they must do and perhaps what they can do, rather than taking a top-down view, trying to explain their behavior in terms of a so-called structure of the world, like balance of power, markets, state structure. This is a fundamental difference, the top-down, bottom-up one, that tracks very nicely onto positivist and interpretivist understandings. In another talk, I will return to this division between interpretivists and positivists and look at the ways in which they both struggle to define what knowledge is and by doing that step back and offer an evaluation of these two epistemologies. Thank you.